Hello, I'm Rob Wallace, STEM educator here at the National World War II Museum, and welcome to today's webinar, From Christmas Lights to Bomb Fuses. All right, so let's go to the slides. So in the early 1940-41, there was a big mess in England. The, the Germans were flying over and bombing every night. About in those two years, about 40,000 people died in England. Uh, half of those were in London. Uh, it created a, just a lot of havoc and a lot of fear and a lot of death. People slept sometimes in the tube, uh, which obviously was not running uh, because it was underground and it was a little safer. It was terrifying. The Luftwaffe, the German Air Force, was flying over in these bombers and dropping bombs uh, on the city. It was, it was a terror campaign. They were trying to soften the German people, the British people up, soften their resolve so that they would, because they were the only thing uh, at that time, they were the major country fighting against the Germans. It was before uh, Germany had turned to attack the Soviet Union. The United States was out of the war, so they were focused on England. So the German, so the British, they had some defense systems. They put up these barrage balloons. Uh, the pilots flew mostly at night. The German Luftwaffe flew at night, so they wouldn't see these balloons. They might crash into them and they hung nets from them. They also had a radar system that got better really fast, a very good radar system where they could see uh, the planes coming in and map where they were coming in, scramble fighter jets, they had a really great, well-organized system for, for putting the radar together with information and scrambling the planes. But just sending planes out was not highly effective. I mean, there were still a lot of bombs coming down. It wasn't good enough. They could shoot their anti-aircraft guns up in the air, but most of the, you had to shoot thousands and thousands of shells to hit an airplane. And uh, even then, that was really dangerous because the shells could come down unexploded and, and explode on, on the city. You know, anything you shoot up is going to come down if it doesn't hit something up in the air. So there were lots of problems. So they had to find a way to knock down, knock out these planes and take them out before they could drop their bombs over the city. Um, how were they going to do this? So again, they had radar, they had radar on the planes, but that's miniaturized radar for a plane, okay? Um, think about, let's think about something that you're more familiar with. You're probably not familiar, that familiar with shooting down planes, but you probably have played dodgeball. So let's say you're, you're throwing the ball at your opponent and you wanna hit them, but they're not holding still, are they? They're moving. And so you could aim it perfectly, but if they move in a direction you weren't anticipating, you're gonna miss them, right? And that's a problem. Well, what if you could throw the ball and then the ball broke up into smaller balls as it approached them and got close to them? Then you would increase your chance of hitting them, your opponent, right? So this was the idea they kind of developed. How do they do that? But what does that need to do? So that technology would need to know when you were close to your target and when to break up, right? And so how, are they, how would they manage that? So they decided to modify radar. And the British developed a theoretical, say outlined the way this could work. Uh, to have use radar on the tip of a bomb that was going up in the air to explode. But think about how big these tubes were. So this is an example of a radio tube from the time period. This is a smaller German radio tube from the time period. So is, is something like this gonna do well on the tip of a bomb? These are radio crystals. So these are all the things that would send out radio waves. And then they had to have a receiver. This is a, a way that you could receive radio waves. Um, 
So they had to find a way to miniaturize that with these tubes. And then let's review how radar works. Here I've made a foil airplane. And you can see, so as it goes by, you can see it reflecting the light out into the camera. So, so as the plane goes by over time, it's, the reflection is changing. And so on the screen, it's going to show. So how are they going to manage to miniaturize this stuff? Okay, they have the idea, but they have to work on miniaturizing it. Well, England is really, uh, like we said, they're being bombed. So they sent a lot of this technology over to the United States. And in the United States, they developed a team to, to figure out how to miniaturize this stuff and make it work. So let's go back to the slides. And we'll see this picture, okay? This used auto store became uh, the Applied Physics Laboratory at Johns Hopkins University. Now, Johns Hopkins, today we think of them as like medicine and stuff, but they also do applied physics. They do a lot of work uh, still today with the Defense Department. So in 1942, they got the task from the government to figure out um, the government was really involved in all of this. They didn't just let people respond to, our, to requests for help. They would say, oh, you've got a bunch of electronics and physics people. Why don't you work on this? So the people at the Applied Physics Laboratory worked on finding ways to make really small radio transmitters, really small radio receivers and switches to do this. Now, another problem they had to face was that these things weren't just flying on a plane, they were flying on, a, on the front of a rocket that was really moving really fast and spinning. So they had to be tough. So as they designed the electronic circuits, they had to find manufacturers who could make them. So back then, you know, everything, most things ran on tubes. There were computers, but they were huge things that took up whole houses. Um, how are they going to do this? So they found, they thought they found somebody who was making relatively small electronic stuff. And it was the people that made Christmas lights. So um, GE and Sylvania were making Christmas lights back then. And they wanted um, to get those folks to also make for them. To, they weren't making Christmas lights then. Christmas lights actually got popular in the 30s. And, um, and then they, um, they really were taken off and then they stopped making them during World War II. And some of those companies were making other things, but some of them switched over to making uh, these proximity fuses as they became to be called. So they worked in facilities like this and they had to make these really tiny circuits. And this is the first time that we get what we call uh, printed circuits, okay? So today in computer science class, you'll hear about PCBs, which are printed circuit boards, okay? And that, this is the first time that they really mass produce printed circuit boards. And what that means is that they can make really small wires that could connect between small radio receivers and transmitters. So the, the thing on the head of this rocket, okay? This is a picture of one like the one we have in our collection. These are very rare today and they were super talk secret about the only thing that was as, there were three things that were probably the most top secret in terms of technological innovations in World War II. That was anything Manhattan Project, this proximity fuse, and the Norden bomb site. And you can see on this one, it says that it's made in at Johns Hopkins Applied Physics Lab. And so at the top is the, all the circuitry. It's a radio receiver, a radio transmitter, and then a switch. And then it plugs down into the bomb. It screws into the top of the, of the rocket that's going up in the air. And this is what the um, circuitry inside it would look like, okay? It's not a lot of detail because this, this was released right after the war and it was still very sensitive technology. 
we didn't we sent a lot of different kinds of weapons to our allies we did not send any of these to the um to our allies because we wanted to keep it secret uh, they were very careful using them to make sure that um, they didn't get into german hands and so let's go to back to the um document camera and you'll see here this is an example i don't know if you knew we, if you know we could do this but i've drawn with pencil two lines here uh, dark shaded lines and uh, there's a little tiny LED bulb okay and check this out let me go this way it's going to be a little hard to see because it's very dim but you will see that this light lights up can you tell that it lights up no so it lights up if I move it a little closer Gonna light up a little more. I think you can see that better, right? Can you see it? So it lights up. So that's an example of a hand printed circuit. You could make uh, something that's not gonna carry any any electricity at all, like the paper, and then you print onto it something that's gonna carry some electricity, and you use it as a printed circuit board. Um, another activity that's part of our real world science curriculum is this Play-Doh. We make this Play-Doh that conducts electricity. Probably you, have, you may have seen this before or some of our teachers have seen this before. And we plug it in. And you can see that it lights up. Make that straight so it'll go in. Whoa, do you see that light up? Okay. Off, on. So we can use strange materials with strange properties like carbon from um, this printed circuit or this dough here to make new kinds of circuits um, that will behave in ways that are different and unusual. And we can use that science today and back then uh, to make technology work the way we need it to. Now, this brings us to the question. Can you switch to the camera on me? Um, why do we learn about giant tubes and technologies that they used so long ago? I mean, we don't need to use this stuff anymore. It's got the stuff, even the insulator on the outside, they were short on rubber, so it's got ceramic insulator. Why do we need to learn about how they made things back then when it's so old and we don't even use that technology anymore? Well, the answer is, is that we, we can learn from the ways that they solved those problems. They had big, big problems. And just think about it from 1942, these bombs were being used in 43 and 44. So just in a year, a year and a half, they figured out how to take tubes like this and miniaturize them down into tiny tubes and design circuits. And then they learned how to print circuits and they learned how to take somebody that was making Christmas lights in Ohio and Massachusetts and pivot that business around so that it was making these bombs, these bomb fuses, and keep it all secret. And make it happen. And so it was, it was a miracle almost. And we can take what they did back then, maybe not the exact same technologies, but we could take those approaches. We can learn from the fact that we can make uh, Play-Doh circuits um or that we can make pencil graphene circuits and we can use our knowledge of that kind of stuff and the strategies that like people use back then to solve some of the big problems in the world today okay like a big pandemic like climate change these are big technological problems that we have to solve today we can take those uh, the approaches that people used in the past to, um, to talk about them today. 
So I want to know what questions you guys have. Where did the museum get these artifacts? I'd have to look up exactly where we got the proximity views, um, but we get them from donations from people mostly. Um, these are artifacts that I get to use because um, the museum already doesn't really have a use for them or, or it may have an old um, circuit, an old tube like this, but we don't know exactly who used it and what and so it's really cool, but it's not important historically, but we can use it still to tell a story uh, in our education department. So a lot of these come from donations, things that people have in their trunks or something. You know, these, um, these I got from ham operators that have old radios that send them to us, things like that. Um, people's, you know, we had 14 million, 16 million soldiers back then. And, you know, there were only 120 people in the country. So just about everybody's uncle or grandfather served in World War II. And uh, so a lot of this stuff is out there floating around. Why, why did radar help in wartime? So before radar, people used sound waves. And uh, we actually have in our STEM gallery, this big strange Dr. Seuss looking contraption that's just a giant ear cones. And they actually also made cones that went on the side of people's heads. And they would uh, use them to amplify sound so they could hear where the planes were coming from. So sound waves, light waves, and radar waves are a type of light wave. They have similar properties, but in some ways they're different. And one way in which they're very different is their speed. So light travels much faster than sound. Um, and you've probably noticed this, like for example, when you see lightning or fireworks, you hear the sound afterwards um, because the light waves come to you faster than the sound waves. Um, so they use sound waves in World War I and into World War II. They use sound waves still with um, undersea because the light waves aren't as reliable underwater. Um, and, but they learned uh, the British that advanced technology. So the Germans had some radar, but not very good radar. And uh, the, the British developed really good radar technology using a device called uh, cavity magnetron. And there's one in it probably in your house. It's in your microwave oven. Um, and they, because somebody else that was building them discovered that they also can make certain things hot if they're tuned to the right frequencies. So they made those microwaves that would go out and bounce back. So think about this plane right here. So it's gonna come and it's gonna bounce back. Uh, the light's gonna bounce back and tell you it's there. And so they used that radar. Um, at first they used it just in big arrays in those rooms like I showed you where people telling the planes where to go. Later in the war, they were able to mount radar in the front of the airplane so that the airplanes themselves could tell if they were approaching uh, an object. Um, they also found out that they could uh, see storms with radar. So today, probably the way that most people use radar is you know, on your phone app or on the screen you'll see a storm, you know, rain bands coming. We're using radar to do that. So radar's now been used for lots and lots of cool technologies. All right, I've got to get close to the screen so I can see. Did the German army have something like this? They did not have proximity fuses. And actually, um, we can talk about acceleration on both sides. Uh, in June of 1944, the Germans started shooting rockets at, um, these really advanced rockets called the V1 and V2 rockets at England. And the proximity fuses were very effective at, fine, at, at, at getting those. They weren't like today we have rockets that can target something. So we had to shoot them at them. If they weren't nearby, they wouldn't find them, but they would get close and they would blow up. And then there were many pieces to take out that rocket instead of just 
the one thing piercing it. All right, your family had a Christmas light factory in New York City. How can I find out if they were part of this effort from 1937 through the late 1970s? Well, you can uh, look through the records. You can see if they had government contracts. Uh, the National Archives has records on um, what companies had contracts uh, with the US government. Um, you can find, you'd have to go there because they're not all digitized, but the National Archives has the records of the Office of Science and Research. Um, if you email me, I'll send, I'll send you the link to how to get that or tweet me or something. The big vacuum tubes and old TVs. Um, so they had tubes uh, before the war, all those radios, you see all those people gathered around the radios uh, during uh, the depression. Um, that was, they didn't have TV, they had radio. All those tubes, um, they were just commonly used. They obviously had to have tougher tubes to use in the war, but um, tubes were used uh, until the, through the 1980s, my uh, high school band, we had Marshall amps and the, and the uh, amps all used tubes. And it was in a one way it was convenient because if the tube blew out, I could buy a new tube and replace it. Today, if the circuit blew out on my amp, I'd have to buy a new amp. So um, it, it miniaturized it. Um, the tubes were smaller in, in TVs when I was a kid. In the 70s, the tubes were, you know, about this big. They were much smaller. Um, this would have been a really big tube back then. This is cool because this is a German tube. I don't know where it came from, but it was part of the war effort because it says Wehrmacht on the back of it. Um, all right, question about Christmas lights. Yes, they worked through GE and Sylvania companies both both worked with those. Um, so radar stands for, um, that it actually, first you have to think about sonar, which stands for uh, sonographic uh, detection. I don't know, I'd have to look it up again. Um, and then they based radar on the same thing. So in England, they actually call it, they don't have it all capitalized, but it's uh, range and detecting something. I'd have to look it up. I forget. I don't have a good memory for those sort of things. So the Germans have a submarine that could absorb sound waves. Yes, they did. They figured out ways to go silent, to not send any sound waves, but also to absorb them. And shortly after World War II, uh, people started figuring out how to make planes that didn't reflect as much radar. So they would put something on the surface. For example, I made this Paper, this paper airplane out of foil instead of paper. If it were paper, it would reflect light not as well. I can make it out of something else that would just absorb light. So they could either change the shape of it so that it wouldn't reflect as much, or they could change the material on the surface that, so that it wouldn't reflect enough. And that's a way to get around radar. There you go. Somebody help me out there. Thank you, Merlin. Sound, navigation, and ranging, radio detection and ranging. So when the war started, um, radar was pretty primitive. And uh, the, the Germans actually were really surprised at how good they couldn't understand how the British Spitfire teams were finding their planes so well. And uh, the, the British actually played into it by developing some propaganda to confuse the Germans. They, told, they, they put out stories that they were, they were feeding lots of carrots to the pilots so that the pilots could see in the dark. Um, but the Germans really had no idea. And, um, and it was this switch to microwaves uh, for radar that really made the big dif difference. Microwaves are very short waves. And so they could see more uh, in more detail. They could see objects in more detail. And um, the Germans really didn't have a way of detecting these waves. So we were sending them out and bouncing them off their planes, and they didn't even know it was happening. A reflective radio wave. Yep, that's true. It's a, um, it goes backwards and forwards. It means the same thing. That's called a 
at something. I forget what it's called. Okay, the 1950s Christmas bubble lights. Um, no, they weren't adapted from a military device. It's the opposite way around. They actually started those bubble lights right before the war. They were very popular and they're cool looking. Um, if you're not sure what I'm talking about, you can find them on eBay. People sell them for $100 or something. Um, but you can, uh, they took the Christmas lights and the people that made those little tiny wires and stuff, they used their, those people and their factories to make the uh, proximity fuse. So this wasn't a case where Christmas lights came out of the war effort. It was where the bomb fuse was made by these people. All right, so the bomb fuse, the way it worked was that it, it would go out and it actually had a ring around it where it was sending out um, radio waves. So, and, and it was receiving radio waves too. So when the radio waves came back to it, when the same radio waves came back to it, it would know that um, something had reflected back. Now, as it got closer and closer to the object, that meant that um, it, the speed of the time that it took to come back told it how close it was to the object. So it would have a trigger time. You would set a trigger time on it. And that would tell you how close it was. And that would close a circuit, which would send an electrical charge to the bomb and, and have it go off. So you could, you could adjust it to make it closer or go off closer or further from the object you were targeting. Um, but it made a ring. It didn't send it out in front um, because that would really limit how close it got to the object. If you're shooting up into a bunch of planes flying by, you don't want to um, just be looking in front of you. You want to be looking around you because if it's going this way and the plane's going that way, you want it to have it have a ring that way. All right. How did these change these factories around to make new stuff during the war? So lots of factories changed. Um, Chrysler went from making uh, transmissions to making these pivots that would work on the guns that were out on the ships. And um, other a factory uh, that used to make equipment to, for farm Harvesting equipment would make the, um, turned around to make the, these landing vehicles. So there were lots of examples of companies that pivoted during the war. If you wanted to buy a new car, 1942, in the United States, you couldn't because the car manufacturers were making tanks or airplanes or other things instead. Now they sometimes built new facilities for these, but sometimes they used the old facilities and they certainly used uh, the workers. We, were, we had a real shortage of workers. Can you tell us more about how radar was first invented? So the way the radar was first invented, it, it goes back to Marconi. So Marconi made the radio and um, he, he, they discovered that um, these radio waves um, just accidentally, if they were trying to send them across mountain range or something, they wouldn't work. And they also found that radio waves bounced off of layers of the atmosphere. And so from that, they started to figure out how, um, how they could use them to bounce off of something and detect. Uh, radar actually started as the idea um, that they would send like a death ray, like a, a radiation wave that would hit an object. Um, there was a research group uh, at a place called the Rad Lab in the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. And they were working on this way that they could send electromagnetic radiation and it would kill the pilot. Um, that didn't work out. Um, sounds kind of horrible. But, it, but they, in the process, they discovered that the waves were bouncing off of the plane and coming back to them. And then it was a matter of just figuring out, fine tuning which waves works, worked best and which kind of receivers uh, worked best. Um, so, so that was really cool. So, and, and Marconi, by the way, 
started, um, he was Italian, but his mom was actually Irish. And he got his money from uh, the Jameson's uh, whiskey family. His mom was a, uh, uh, made the whiskey and they, um, they actually, she actually gave him the money to start his, his company. So what part of the proximity fuse, if any, allowed the anti-aircraft crews to set the fuse to explode the shell at a certain altitude as opposed to exploding the shell when it's radar indicated? So the crews didn't set it usually. It was usually, they had ones with different settings for different distances and they were sent to the crew that way because it's not, it's not very adjustable. So they would make sets that, um, that had different types and they would screw them into the front. Uh, the older bombs, uh, some, of, some of the anti-aircraft stuff, they would just try to shoot up and it would just pierce through the plane or maybe explode on impact. They had other bombs like the dive bombers, they had bombs that have a propeller on the front and they would set it to however long, how many times the propeller went around. The radar range, radar range can be very far on these, um, on these proximity fuses. They made it to go about 100 feet uh, because um, that was kind of the parameters of what they needed. And that way they didn't have to make as, uh, as big a device. So for the radar beam to go further, they would have to have a, a bigger device. Could it be intercepted? Um, so these are not very big. These would be rockets that would be, you know, maybe about eight inches in diameter. So it would be really hard uh, to intercept them. Um, they're not like the rockets that we think of today, the missiles that we send today, which are really big, big rockets. Okay, I think that's uh, about it. If you think of any more questions, if you want to know how to make paper circuits, if you wanna know how to make squishy circuits, uh, send us a message either by Twitter, the museum has a Twitter handle, the museum has a, um, has a Facebook page, we have a teacher Facebook page, um, all of those are ways, or you could look up my email. It's rob.wallace at nationalworldwar2museum.org. Um, and you could check it out there. If you come to the museum and you want to see stuff about radar, there's um, not that much on display. Electronics don't hold up that well. Um, but if you go to the uh, Campaigns of Courage, and you go to the road to Berlin, there's a room that's set up to look like a, a hangar that the pilots would have taken out of. And there's a bunch of uh, airplane equipment in there. Once we can fully open, we will have the STEM gallery open um, in, the, in the Krishna Restoration Pavilion. And we have um, radios and stuff like that and a range finder. And like I said, the big sonar listening device the Germans used that sonar listening device all the way through uh, World War II. Um, and so that's a very rare artifact and we have that in the Krishna Restoration Pavilion. So until then, uh, until we see you in person at the museum or at a teacher workshop, if you're a teacher, um, I wanna say goodbye and happy holidays.